and we have one with us. So Shirley, thank you for coming today. I, uh, let's see, I had something. What I wanted to ask you is, uh, you can either sit on there or over on the pew. What I wanted to ask you was, uh, what do you like most about July the 4th? I, I was greeting Shirley, and and uh, you said, there was a party yesterday. And I said, well, what party was it? And you said, yeah, it was like, it's a 4th of July party. There's no mystery to that. So let me ask you this. Uh, what is your favorite thing to do to celebrate July the 4th? Now, it might be a party, but maybe it's something else. Do you have a favorite thing that you, you like to do to celebrate? Fireworks. 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 You know, I, I think as a kid, I like fireworks more than anything else. Why? In fact, there, there have been times that I, that I walk around with fireworks. Oh, yeah. You see, these are the kind that, that, well, they're the kind that you can even have indoors as children's sermons. <laughs> I love these. Have you ever seen fireworks like these? No. No. She's a little worried right now. <laughs> fireworks, oh, it's just so funny. It happens as quick as, as that, or it does. These are really old, too. Oh, no. Oh, that's my wife. She's looking at that. There we go. Would you like to try one? Then that's okay. <laughs> no, fireworks. Fireworks is... See, that's what those kids like. But there are other ways to celebrate. Let's look at some of the other ways to celebrate. Why don't you turn these front lights off? Let's see these pictures. All right, here's another way to celebrate. More fireworks. Uh, how many got to see some fireworks last night in the sky? Okay, that's pretty good. We had some neighbors that started firing them off at about, what, 2 in the afternoon? Okay, so uh, here's another... Well, this is one I tried out yesterday. Anybody ever tried this where you put a firecracker? Thank Brian, we are we are on the same wavelength. <laughs> you, you put a firecracker in there and you and you blow the can up from water and, and it's really cool. Absolutely cool, but you gotta have bigger firecrackers than lady fingers. Alright? But look at this. This is a great way to celebrate July the fourth. It's eat eat patriotic food. Like cake, but it's got to be red, white, and blue. Anybody ate patriotic food yesterday? Oh, some of you did. Some of you did. I don't think we had anything that was red, white, and blue. The table. The table. She made the table red, white, and blue. And here's another great way to celebrate. And this is what we did. This is an even better way to celebrate. We sing. We sing. My country tis of thee. Liberty. So well, that's a great thing. And, and I'm thinking to myself, there's got to be a better way to celebrate July the 4th. This is it. This is to pray because then we're thanking God for July the 4th. So let's pray now. Dear God, thank you for this nation and for the freedom we have. We can freely go to church without fear. We can freely travel from one city to another, one state to another. We thank you for the freedoms that are in this land. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming up here. We also went to a parade. You went to a parade? Yeah. Oh, the Bach Parade. Absolutely. Thanks for coming up here. Okay, I know how many number there are here. I'll know what they want to We were in it. You were in it? Really? What What were you in? I was on a wagon. And then we had our tractors there pulling. We had one pulling the wagon and the other was A tractor pulling the wagon. 
right? Clayton, it's coming. A tractor pulling. All right, it's coming. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you all got to celebrate in different ways July the 4th. And the message that I have for you now is all about freedom and the inalienable rights that we have. Inalienable means not to be taken away. This is our heritage, our right. It's a, uh, after the preamble of the Declaration of Independence, and if you remember it, say it with me. All men are created equal. They are endowed with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Let's say those last ones again. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Let's pray. Lord, we come to the scriptures now, and as we think about the rights as citizens of this great country, we, we want to bow our heads before you and acknowledge, and humbly acknowledge that you ultimately led this country uh, in a righteous way to have these rights. And yet, as we consider them and the abuses of them, we confess that uh, our nation is far from perfect far from it, and yet we give you thanks for our freedom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Well, as you detected in the prayer, there is a two-sided uh, looking at these three rights, uh, the right, the basis for that right, but then the abuse of that right. So first of all, there's life. Tis a gift. You know, just those first three words, tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free. That gift is giving you, and we're acknowledging it's from God. It's a gift. Life is the greatest gift that we receive. In the Declaration of Independence, the definition there of this life is the freedom to live, to exist without fear of someone putting an end to your life. And the basis of that comes from uh, Exodus 22, verse 13. Exodus 22, verse 13. That is the Ten Commandments. And so I'll read it for you. <laughs> and that is not the correct passage, so I, I apologize about that. I, and I apologize about that. How can I be wrong on the Ten Commandments? Okay, it's in chapter 20. Sorry about that. Chapter 20. That's where the Ten Commandments are. That's what I wanted to go through. Chapter 20, verse 13. It's very very plain, very clear. You shall not murder, murder. That's the basis of my saying that you have this right, the freedom to have your life and no one take it from you. But the abuse of this right, we read just a little further, a little closer on that, that uh, section of the Declaration of Independence we read, all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. So it's their creator. God is the creator of our life. So when did God create us? Did he create us at, well, when we came out of the womb? Created us when we were knit within the womb. And so this is where the abuse takes place. Since 1973, the Supreme Court's decision on Roe versus Wade, there's been some confusion as to the right to life. It seems as though the right doesn't exist for the first nine months. 
I did a little bit of research uh, this morning, just again as a reminder. Since 1973, 50 million abortions have taken place. It staggers the mind. Over 50 million abortions. People who did not receive the gift of life. Last, <clears throat> the closest records I could come online with were from 1917, I said it wrong, 2017 through 2018. The good news is it was the lowest level of abortions that take, have taken place in our country. That's the lowest level ever. That's, that's good news, and yet <clears throat> it's still troubling. There were 345,672 abortions. This is an abuse in light of the fact that the, the human gene is being mapped. There is more and more understanding of the nature of, of conception that, it, that life begins there. The only thing that changes after conception is simply growth. So our, our country is battling with that. And yet we cannot seem to overturn Roe versus Wade. So I see that as an abuse of that right to life. Secondly, <coughs> there's the <coughs> inalienable right of liberty. Liberty. Now the, the, def the definition of liberty encompasses the freedoms of expression, association, and selection. It's, liberty is the right to choose. And this is a right that that we enjoy in this country. The basis for it is Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. And that far back, it should, it should prompt you into thinking what the basis of that right to choose comes from. It's the creation of Adam and Eve. Genesis 1, 27, we read this, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. <clears throat> being created in God's image is the basis of our being able to choose. To choose. Adam and Eve chose to speak to one another. Chose to meet with the Lord and speak with the Lord. Chose to name the animals. And it goes on and on. And the abuse of this right to choose began with Adam and Eve as well. For they chose to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, even though they were told they could go anywhere else except that place. They chose to abuse the right. We are all creatures of the human race. We all have Adam and Eve as our long ago ancestors. And so we are abusing the right for liberty, the right to choose. Let me give you two examples of how uh, an abuse of this seems ever so ominous. Here's one example taken from June of 2000. <clears throat> it was the case of the Boy Scouts versus Dale. Uh, the Boy Scouts' right to ban homosexual leaders was challenged by a gay former scoutmaster, I, I don't know his first name, but his last name was Dale. <clears throat> and the Supreme Court said the decision that forcing the scouts to accept gay troop leaders would violate the organization's rights of free expression and free association under the Constitution's First Amendment. Uh, that was in the year 2000, but you know how close that vote was. I can't imagine anyone here knowing it. I, I would have to look it up again. It was five to four. And so that's why there is such a battleground over who becomes a Supreme Court judge. So that was the year 2000. Let's take a look at June 2020. And if you have been listening, you have heard this. This was a six to three decision. It wasn't close. Extending protections against employment discrimination to LGBTQ. That deals with lesbians, gay, and 
the unfolding from that. Well, they can have them, or they can't? It is extended to them. Let me read a little further. Under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits workplace discrimination on the basis of race, sex, religion, and national origin. Okay, we are familiar with 64, no discrimination on the basis of race, sex, religion, and national origin. But what the Supreme Court ruled in June of this year was sex refers to not only gender, but also gender identity and sexual orientation. And with one stroke, they changed historical precedent. The, uh, <clears throat> the decision made in 1964 had, had no intention, even back then, of extending the rights to gender identity in the matter of gender confusion. And so that was, that was an abuse, even back to 1964, let alone going back to how God created male and female and the right given by that. As troubling as that is, there is good understanding from Tony Campolo. He's a sociologist, a Christian sociologist. At times he's controversial. But let me read for you what he wrote about this, this shifting within our culture that is so troubling. He wrote this. <clears throat> Sorry, I got something in my throat. <clears> throat> <clears throat> While I think the Constitution lays down the principles that make for the best political system ever devised, the Constitution has one basic flaw. It clearly delineates the Bill of Rights, but it nowhere states a Bill of Responsibilities. Government that in Ensures peoples of their rights, but fails to clearly spell out their responsibilities, fails to call them to be the kind of people God wants them to be. Christianity, excuse me, um, freedom of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness succeeds in a Christian environment, in a Christian nation. But as we get further and further away from that Christian heritage, we lose, in a sense, the goodness of our nation. Maybe you've heard it said before, great countries forfeit their greatness when they cease to be good. This is why people are praying for revival in our nation, because it is a frightening change to we could hardly keep up with the abuse of these God-given inalienable rights. Well, let's go on to the third <clears throat> and final one. The pursuit of happiness. It's self-defining. Pursuing the pursuit of happiness. And the basis for it is found in the scriptures. And here we find it in the book of Ecclesiastes. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, chapter 5. I don't know if you've ever read this book. It is a tremendous book that examines well, what, what life is like if you just pursue anything and everything. It was written by Solomon, but he made some amazing conclusions in this book that are hard to find but well worth remembering. And this is one of them. It's not the best one, but it's one of them. It's uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 19. <clears throat> Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is the gift of God. Tis a gift to be simple. Tis a gift to be free. Tis a gift to come down where you ought to be. And when you find yourself in a place just right, to be in the valley of what? Love and delight. Pursuit of happiness. But 
there is an abuse of this. We need to understand the context of the pursuit of happiness from a biblical perspective. This is found in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All right, so Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 2. Let me back up with verse 1. These are the commands, decrees, and laws of the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land you are crossing to the Jordan to possess. Verse 2. So that you, your children, and your children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all of his decrees and commands that I give you. And so that you may enjoy long life. Enjoy long life. It's the basis of keeping God's commands. And yet, the Ten Commandments can't even be posted in public buildings anymore. How, how can we honor God's commands if we can't even post them? It, so, the abuse of the right to happiness is that that the biblical directive to be happy as God enables you with something other than God. You know what it's called? It's called hedonism. When the pursuit of happiness becomes an end in itself, it's hedonism. And the, the content of hedonism shifts in the direction of a person's sense of morality. Well, I don't think it's wrong to do this. And so I'll pursue that to make me happy. I don't think it's wrong to do that. And so I'll pursue that to make me happy. And so we see that happening almost overnight. All of a sudden, now we're, we're pulling down statues. And the basis of that is simply hedonism. This will make me happy. If I find one little piece of history of someone renowned enough to be a statue, if I find one thing wrong with him, he's coming down. Amazing. And the basis of it all is because the, the God of our Christian heritage, our Christian society, is being dethroned and replaced by hedonism. These are troubling things. The pursuit of this hedonism is indulging in chemical happiness, moral happiness, and ultimately they're not going to find it. They're not going to find easy street. Ironically, I looked this up. Do you know where easy street is? I found it. Um, you go to Honolulu, Hawaii, take the Poly Highway northbound, travel about a third of the way to the Poly Pass, and turn right on Park Street. And go one block, and there it is, Easy Street. Uh, but there is a problem. When you turn left and go one block more, you find dead end. And I'm telling you, what, what's happening is, is this, this plan of pursuing happiness as an end in itself, hedonism, is, is not going to succeed. But rather, it is a dead end. So, with all that troubling reminders about our culture, let us end with the rights we have as citizens, but not of the United States, citizens of heaven. The right to life. These are rights given to anyone in this world. The right to life. It exists only through Jesus Christ. New life in Christ. Jesus said, I come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And no matter what happens to our culture, no matter what culture you're in, Jesus promises life and to live it abundantly. Secondly, the right to happiness. Happiness comes through obedience. 
Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and what? All these things will be added to you. All these things will be added unto you. The things you need to be truly happy, not what you want. The right to liberty, that is the right to choose. God has given us the dignity of choice. Choose life in Christ. Pray for our nation that they choose life in Christ. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate. That's a choice. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through that. See, that's a choice. God does not program people to obey. Sometimes we wish he would, but he will not. Wide is the gate, Jesus continues. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. This past week I've had residents from Elam. I'm the chaplain at Elam. I have been talking with them, and one of the questions that I will ask uh, is, what do you believe about the end of life? And we talk about heaven, and many will turn to me and say, do you believe there's a hell? Mm -hmm. You know, these are vulnerable people that I want to be careful with. And so what I say to them is, Jesus offers the way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so I try not to scare them about hell. I remind them, Jesus opened the path to heaven itself by dying on a cross, paying a penalty for your sin, so you are forgiven, but you choose. You choose to believe in Jesus Christ. The right to choose. So the bottom line, what's the trouble in our country? What's the trouble in individuals? It's as simple as a picture. Here it comes, ladies. Okay, Clay, do you know what kind of tractor this is? I have no idea. I do. Okay, what is it? It's an Oliver. An Oliver? Yeah. Can you guess what year it is? Oh, probably about 1960. Okay. All right, so this is a 1960 Oliver. I feel really good to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a tractor pull. And he's pulling a ton of weight. I have no idea how much weight he's pulling, but it is so much. The front end has come up. And, and when they're tractor pulls, and when they have too much of a load, they are stuck. Now, I don't, I don't know if this guy is spinning his wheel or, or if he's already stuck. What do you think, Clay? Uh, he's moving. He's moving, okay. <laughs> but let me tell you this. If he were stuck, you know the only way to get unstuck? Is you got to unhook the bird. Unhook the bird. In our country, the sin, the abuse of rights, is the burden, and we're spinning our wheels until we let go of that sin and turn to the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we, we confess that our, our country has been built upon great biblical um, righteous laws. We confess that our country is forsaking those righteous laws and replacing it with, with hedonism and evolution and socialism and our country is getting lost. It's getting stuck with such a burden that is being overwhelming. And so, Lord, we thank you that the answer is as simple as letting go of the sin and believing in Christ. And so we come as a, as a representative of this country, and we thank you for the rights you give us through Christ, that no one can take these rights. But we humbly pray on behalf of our nation that you sent revival. Would you do that, Lord? We need it. Amen. Let's stand and
close our time together by singing God of Our Fathers. And as a reminder, we try to put those masks on when we sing. Okay, let's let's sing it. Did he bring his horn? Okay.